I welcome everyone to this seminar. It's one of the most essential seminars for our community that is facing so many issues regarding visa, racism, unemployment, and lots of health issues regarding the stress. Seva started in 2004 to serve the South Asian community in culturally specific way. We have the resources, we have a 24 seven crisis line, and we are here to help you give all the resources that you need. We have a website, which Dashit can share with later on, but right now I'd like you to, I welcome all of you and to join in seminar. And thank you so much for joining. Go ahead, Ravi. Okay, all right. Thank you for everyone. And uh, today's uh, our guest, Mr. Uh, Satvir Singh Chowdhury. Um, he born in 1969. He's an American politician and former member of Minnesota State Senate. And he also served Minnesota House representative from 1996 to 2010. During his 14 year tenure, Chaudhary represented portions of Anoka and Ramsey counties, and also as well as Northern Minneapolis and St. Paul metropolitan area as well. He was the first Asian American legislator in Minnesota history. For a first time, the highest ranking political official of South Asian descent and one of the youngest senators in the state. In 2004, Stephen Chaudhary, law officer founder as well. He was named the University of Minnesota Law School Alumni of the Year. He was also awarded the Governor Certificate of Commendation for the Legal Aid Society of Minnesota and served as special assistance to Minnesota Attorney General Hubert. Chaudhary has lectured at the different uh, schools as well. So uh, Harvard Law School, University of Pennsylvania, Wanton School of Business, Kennedy School of Government, UCLA Law School, University of Michigan, the University of California Law School, and the University of Law Minnesota Law School, recognized by the worldwide Asian Indian community for his dedicated work. Chaudhary was named to the top 50 non-resident Indians in the world. That is shown up in NRI World Magazine and Chaudhary Law Office will fight for each client with the same dedication noted by these organizations. And Chaudhary Law Office is Minneapolis based law firm specialization in immigration, sportsman law, small business and criminal law and all of them focused on religion, country of religion or immigration status. And as I mentioned before, I hand over it to uh, Mr. Chaudhary and I would like all of you request one more time to mute all of your phones and the computers. And if you have any questions, please feel free to post in the chat room. I'm going to read over to Mr. Chaudhary and then we'll get answered. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. How was my volume? How's my volume? Sounds great to me. All right, thank you for everyone's participation and to join us on this lovely evening for this webinar. Um, a particular thanks to Seva for organizing this event. It was their idea. They just happened to invite me to present uh, uh, the issues. And uh, thank you to Ravi for your kind, um, kind uh, introduction, Raj, Dashrath, the, the tech support. Um, these are not easy to put together. Um, I, feel, uh, I feel a bit cuddled because uh, this was very convenient for me and it was because of the, the strong efforts and dedication of the SEVA staff who made it feel easy to put this together. 
So uh, I'm here to talk about the recent H1B ban. Um, and uh, I'm going to, we'll, we'll diverge into a couple of other issues, but that's going to be the, the central focus. We only have an hour and uh, I'm not going to try and take too much time for my presentation. I want to uh, leave enough time for discussion. I've already answered three or four questions in the, uh, in the um, Q and A portion of the, of the screen and I'm happy to continue doing that. Uh, what I will do is uh, we'll start by reading off some of the questions that I've already gotten. I'll read them off and, and answer them so that everyone can benefit. Um, so um, let me just give a, a, a brief chronology. This is all a very brief. Um, this past April, uh, the president the U.S. President Trump uh, issued an executive order suspending new immigrant visas outside, uh, from outside the U.S. Um, there are various exceptions. Um, uh, however, uh, most embassies, well, all of the embassies around the world were closed anyway because of the COVID quarantine. Uh, but um, if and when they reopen and they are starting to reopen, um, this this uh, executive order will become, uh, will be felt more and more. Um, the reason I mention this is because the, the H-1B visa ban uh, or suspension um, on June 22nd is, uh, is, is, is more or less an offshoot of, of the April 21st order. The April 21st order was aimed at immigrant visas. These are the people who are coming to the U.S. Um, and who have been approved to come to the U.S. permanently. Uh, and then, um, but it did not include people who were coming to the U.S. Um, on temporary visas, um, and that includes fiancé visas. But um, the June 22nd order uh, included temporary visas um, not all of them, but uh, the H-1B, and I will go into more detail. We're all here because of the H-1B, but there are still others as well. Um, and it uh, pertained to uh, people without valid visas. So if you're, if you're getting a new H-1B visa, for example, then, then uh, that, um, you know, the, then it did, then the ban applied to them, but not others. Well, there's some clarification. Um, uh, a week later that stated that this also includes people who are um, uh, who are not who are not yet stamped even though you do have a valid visa and are not even though you're not stamped you have a valid visa uh, but the the, uh, the 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 amendment to the order said that um, unless you had a, a stamped visa um, you were under the, you fell under the prohibition of these several categories. Um, and then I'm also going to talk about uh, what happened uh, another week later, and that is uh, where ICE announced that uh, the um, allowance for online coursework for international students that was allowed this past semester during the quarantine was not going to continue for the fall semester. Um, in schools that were, that chose to do online coursework. So uh, real quick about the immigrant visa ban in, in April. Um, it uh, was slated for 60 days, but can be renewed. I'm, I'm sure it will be. Um, it applied to the diversity lottery program, the employment-based immigrant visas, uh, certain family-based visas, uh, immigrant visas for applicants who are outside the U.S. Um, and it, uh, again, it applied only to people who were outside the U.S. and who did not have an approved immigrant visa on April 20th. So that basically meant that, um, uh, that basically meant that if you were coming here as a, in theory, you were coming here as a new immigrant and you were, it was not under a an immediate family-based category, you would be, uh, you would be prohibited from from coming. Um, I think that there were a lot, there was a a lot of flux on who this pertained to. 
Um, in fact, the rule that is issued and the practice within the embassies has often differed and has resulted in litigation. Uh, but um, uh, it did put a scare into people who were coming here on, a, on, a, on an immigrant visa, but not with a, a not under the uh, immediate family member category. So if you, uh, if you finally got your, an finally were approved for a, um, an employment-based uh, green card and you were outside the country, um, you would have to go to an embassy to get your uh, immigrant visa to allow you to come in on that category. Well, that, would, that uh, was then prohibited. Um, that's one example. Um, the uh, other example uh, was um, was the family members, for example, brothers and sisters, did not apply to spouses. Um, then the other question, uh, and this was asked in the in the um, Q and A, does this apply to fiancés? And no, this did not apply to fiancés. In fact, fiancé is not an immigrant visa; it's it's a temporary visa. So uh, because this applied to only immigrant permanent visas, it did not apply to fiance visas. At least it was not supposed to in the rules. Um, and again, um, it, it, um, it, I think it bears repeating that, yes, the ban took place. It didn't affect many people because people were not able to go and get uh, an appointment to have their uh, immigrant visa, uh, a stamping for their immigrant visa anyway, because the embassies were were closed under the quarantine. But uh, happy to take more questions about that later. So then um, a continuation um, in June, uh, even though the president was um, remarking on the importance of opening up the country in, in June, he um, issued an executive order, um, what we call the H-1B visa ban, visa ban but it um, included H-1B visas, uh, L visas, um, h b which are the, the, the seasonal, but not the um, basically hospitality seasonal, J visas, which can include uh, not only exchange students, exchange programs, hospitality, but also foreign medical graduates that they come here on J visas. Um, and of course the corresponding visas for the, their dependents. So the H4s, which corresponds with the H1B, L2s with the L1s, J2s, uh, they were also prohibited. The new ones were prohibited. Um, what did it, it did not apply to spouses or child, children of US citizens. Um, it did not apply to current green card holders. Um, it did not apply to people um, extending their H-1B status, for example, within the U.S. It did not apply to people adjusting their status within the U.S. again. It did not apply to EADs, uh, family petitions, or E-visas. A lot of people here are of Indian descent. E-visas are, 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 for the most part, prohibited. Well, they are prohibited for anyone coming from India. Um, but if you're not, um, you should also know that uh, even though um, the e-visa is a, a, a work or investment or business visa, this was not impacted. Um, so those are the, that's the, those are the basics of, of the ban. And, and this was all done under the guise of uh, of, uh, of uh, a, na a national emergency of, you know, of the, of, of, um, of uh, job protection um, because of the impact that COVID has had on our economy. Um, so then the question came up um, during that week. Um, okay, well, if I have a valid visa, well then I would like, you know, I have a valid visa but some people have a valid visa, but it hasn't been stamped yet. And, um, and there's a big difference. You, know, you, can, you can have a valid visa, but uh, not be, still not have the proper stamping to enter the country. Um, you can have a valid visa, but your technical, techno, technical 
um, expiration of your stay in the US, your I-94 date could have expired, but you still even may have a valid visa. So um, there are some people who had valid visas who had not gotten stamped yet. And um, they said, okay, well, we want, we need to get stamped. Um, you know, I'm not sure how they were getting appointments, but perhaps some were. And, um, but uh, the, there was then a clarification that came down a week later that said a valid visa is one that um, has a stamp on it. Um, now, um, this has been litigated and it is not the law. Um, it is uh, squarely outside, that interpretation is outside the law um, and it's being litigated, but that is what the decision was. Um, and so what this meant was, meant was that even though you had a valid visa, you couldn't go get it stamped and then come back. Um, and it basically meant that if you, uh, uh, that you had to have, basically had to have a current stamped visa to basically to, to go back and forth uh, to be able to come. If you needed to make a stop in the embassy for any, any reason for a temporary visa um, in these categories, in these categories that we listed, um, you are out of luck, uh, certainly for the time being. Um, there were other clarifications too that were onerous, um, where people fell into certain certain situations where they, um, they, they perhaps had a valid stamped visa, such as a, um, uh, such as a visitor visa, uh, but they needed to go um, and get an immigrant visa stamped, or they needed to get a, a, new, um, a, a new H1 stamped. And that is not allowed under this rule. And that was the, the, the second clarification stated that much. Um, and that, puts, that uh, potentially puts someone in a real bind because if they have a, for example, if they have, um, if they have a, an approval for an H-1B visa, but they only have a stamped tourist visa, then back to the, the they technically cannot cannot come back to the U.S. under a category in which they do not intend to, you know, exercise those limits. So you can come back to the U.S., but you're not stamped for an H-1B, which means you may have a valid H-1B visa, but because you could not get stamped, you can't come back and work, and that's a big impact. Um, and then the other clarification uh, was that, uh, as I said, that a valid visa is defined as having a stamp, which is, is simply not the case, but that is what the order said, and that's, that's being litigated. Um, I'm going to uh, kind of pause here and, and um, answer a quick question in the Q&A. Um, what do you mean, Once one person asked, what do you mean by stamped? Um, and that's a good question. I guess I uh, assumed that uh, the, the listeners would know what stamping means because they have gone through it, but some people may not. Um, there is a, the process, there is a, there, there's a st several step process. I'm just gonna try and summarize it. There's a st several step process for coming to the US um, under any given category of, of entry. Um, first you are approved by, first you're approved by, in general, by the Department of Homeland Security. So if I want an H-1B visa, the Department of Homeland Security um, approves that. Uh, but then you have to, then you have to take that approval and you have to take it to the Department of State. In many cases, sometimes you can just uh, change your status here in the U.S. But many times, it, it, eventually, every person will will travel outside the U.S. They will have to come back, um, but they will have to have that visa stamped, quote unquote, stamped. So you'll have to make a stop in the U.S. Embassy before coming back to the U.S. or coming to the U.S. for the first time. And in the passport, they put a, a sticker. Um, and that sticker is, quote unquote, the stamp. And it says 
and it has the, the individual's picture and it shows that they are, they are coming on a, uh, a, a, a visa, H-1B visa in this case. Um, and this is, when it's, this is when it was approved. This is when it's technically approved till, and that's a stamp by the Department of State. So um, sometimes, and there are some categories that even require additional stops. Um, uh, even the H-1B visa requires a, an approval from the Department of Labor even before the Homeland Security gets to it. But what we mean by stamp is they've, they've made a stop at the U.S. Embassy in their home country, generally their home country. Sometimes you can do it through another country. And, um, and the, there's something in your passport and that's what you show, that is what you show to the customs officer when you come into the US. And then that custom officer actually does, you know, the, the ink stamp and they put that on into the passport. But when we, when we say going, going for stamping, that means, um, that means you have that sticker in your passport. And that's what the proclamation said that even though you may have had a valid visa, your visa isn't, isn't, isn't really valid for the purposes of this suspension until it's stamped. And what that means is that, um, it means that, uh, means that you, can't, you can't come to the US even though you have a valid visa. And, by, and again, we come into, the, uh, come into the issues of embassies even being open to, open to uh, allow for that stamping. Um, all right, so then I'll end. Uh, there's other questions coming in. I will definitely get to them as we move further. Um, so then even though we're talking about the H-1B ban, ban, H1B ban, it's important to talk about um, the additional restriction that came up in early July, and that is the student visa restriction. And just to uh, summarize, there is um, international students have certain requirements for classes they have to take. Um, for the most part, they must take in classroom um, coursework that is in a brick and mortar classroom. Um, there's hardly any allowance at all for online coursework. Well, there was a discretionary allowance during the quarantine, um, during this, the second semester of, of universities that allowed for students to do that um, because that's what universities were doing. There were no, there were no brick and mortar classes allowed, uh, uh, offered, the, you know, all the universities closed down. So, um, well, then the, the question is, is that going to continue uh, in universities? Are they, you know, it, are universities going to reopen or are they going to continue online coursework? And that has, um, that's a mixed bag right now. And um, some universities are actually deciding to be completely online, um, including Harvard University. Some are doing a hybrid of some coursework, um, limited coursework in, in class, and, um, and then the rest online. Some, some, are, um, some are doing in-class coursework up until the Thanksgiving break, and, uh, and then just doing completely online, especially you know, during exam times. Well, the problem is, is that once a, an international student stops taking, uh, uh, stops attending any brick and mortar um, coursework, they are out of status. And um, the, um, the government stated on, January, on July 7th that there would be no exception allowed this semester like there was the previous semester. And that it would simply, if, if only online classes were available at the a student's school, they would have to depart or they would be out of compliance. Uh, there was a big uproar about this. Even I was interviewed on TV. Harvard University uh, filed suit um, and there was a big hearing on it um, earlier this week. All of the different reasons we can imagine that, that this would, uh, for which this, this would provide uh, difficulties. Um, and so uh, there was such an uproar that um, and frankly, I think that there were, there were the, the lawsuit from Harvard University and others, other schools was going to be successful. 
in my view. Um, well, yesterday the government an, uh, announced that they were going to reverse their decision and, um, and international students were not going to be we're not going to be prohibited from online classes for now. We will see what it comes out of out of it um, as we move closer, closer and closer to the uh, start start of fall semester. All right. So I that is the um, that is the the long and short of my presentation. Um, I want to get to uh, let me, let's just start with covering some of the Q and A that. The, the questions that came up in the chat box, and I will, um, I, I've already answered some of them, but um, let's, uh, let's go through and, and see if people's questions are answered. If not, be, uh, by all means, type in your questions in the Q&A portion. Um, first question was, um, a person's daughter, daughter's H4 extension has been pending for nine months. Um, there is a rule that says uh, if it is uh, if an extension has been pending for um, more than 240 days, uh, that person must depart. You cannot simply have an unlimited uh, amount of being on technical extension of status, waiting for it. Uh, it's it's unfair. I mean, it's it's not uh, a person's fault that they have not received an answer from the government, but that is the rule. Uh, so the question is, does this does their daughter have to travel back? And my answer is technically yes. But the problem is that travel right now is quite impossible. Uh, so my, my suggestion is to um, uh, document efforts uh, of the attempt to travel back to the US, try to get a plane ticket, um, that type of thing. Um, so that when the time comes, you know, when you're asked, why didn't you depart? Well, we tried and we, we couldn't, it was out of our hands. Uh, we're, in, we're in a very unfair period of time where things that are out of control of non-citizens are, are nonetheless being counted, counted against them. Now, the next question was uh, regarding the K-1 visa process. This is a, a, a fiance visa. Um, how is the a fiance visa affected? And that I mentioned, I talked that the, the, at the moment, the fiance visas are not affected either by the, immig uh, the um, permanent immigration suspension or the temporary visa suspension. Um, and then another, the other part of the question was if a, um, an applicant for an H-1B has a, an American citizen fiance who's trying to get the K visa, the fiance visa, um, do these compete somehow? Um, is, there an, is, there, is there some disadvantage to getting one or the other? And uh, no, the answer is no. Um, you should definitely move forward. Um, with both, you don't. You, you'll probably get the fiance visa sooner, um, but I would keep the H one in play. Um, the next question was, what is the status? Uh, there's a long question on on some some on on uh, some policy considerations that have been bantied about. They're not really rules now. What what is the status of H four EADs? There's been discussion of of ending those from the Trump administration. Um, there's been discussion of a um, merit system, how will that impact um, H-1B visas and green card filings. Um, there's a rumor about 300,000 applicants for uh, adjustment of status. Um, is this true? Um, and I, my answer is really that I, 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 I try, we have enough to talk about on the, the rules that are actually going on right now. Um, these are all policy considerations. Um, you know, there, there's, there really is, we are really in the wild west in terms of what the immigration authorities are doing. You'll hear threats, then they back off. You hear proposals, then they back off. Um, if, a, if a proposal is sincere, then um, it hasn't been implemented yet, or its uh, mechanics have not, not been worked out. Um, some some are simply dependent on actions by Congress, and Congress is has not been very good at all on new H one uh, new immigration rules. 
So uh, I, I just really try not to talk too much about about rumors. I don't. I just don't think they're helpful, especially in the hour we have. We've got enough to talk about. Um, let's see. Uh, not an H one B question, but in, in these current times, can we still apply for a green card for our in laws? Um, so the question is, um, can you apply? The answer is absolutely. Um, when and if will it be approved? Um, that is, you know, that is up in the air. But really, these are the times where if you are thinking about getting an application in, it's not going to, you know, even if we are at full, you know, full permission to approve, uh, there's such a backlog from the quarantine in and of itself that you should get your applications in as soon as possible. And, you know, you may want to really consider having an attorney do it for you in these times. Um, we're finding that they're really just, um, they're trying to, uh, they're looking for lots and lots of reasons to deny people. Um, question was, uh, my husband came to this country 38 years ago. It took me, his wife, several visits to the U.S. Embassy and denials before I was granted a visa to join my husband. We suffered through the separation anxiety for two years before I joined my husband. Here's my question. Shouldn't immigration to any country be a privilege and not a right? Um, you know, we, um, we talk about uh, privileges versus rights within the immigration system. Um, and um, the thing we need to understand about our immigration system is, is that it is a function of, you know, it is a, is a system that has been created by law. And um, this is, these are federal statutes that um, are laid out for our immigration system. And, um, and the, the, as such, the law applies to everyone. And, um, and so if the law, if, because you're a non-citizen and immigration laws apply to you, you have a right to expect that the law will be applied equally to everyone. Um, and so um, the fact that these are laws make make them a right. Now the question, and you may want to split hairs and say, well, is it, is, it is, a, is it a constitutional right to immigrate to the US? Um, well, um, technically, yes, it is. We had, there's a freedom of movement and, and such, but we have laws that have been upheld by our constitution to restrict immigration. Um, and, uh, but as you can see by a, a lot of the lawsuits over the last three years, there have been constitutional challenges to the restrictions on immigration and those challenges have been upheld. So um, shouldn't immigration to any country be a privilege and not a right? I don't know about other countries. I'm sure immigration to some countries is only a privilege, but in the US, because we have a law, we have federal statutes that apply to everyone, they, um, any non-citizen has a right to have those laws applied to them um, equally, um, just as anyone else. Um, is the quota system still being implemented? Um, it depends on what you mean by the quota system. In general, yes, we have a quota system. We have quota systems in a variety of different categories. Uh, one of the, the biggest quotas that we, um, I mean, there's quotas within H-1Bs. There's a, you know, there's an annual cap on new H-1Bs of about, uh, about 80,000. Um, uh, there is a quota on the amount of of people that can immigrate to the U.S. Uh, from a particular country, so no, there, we have a law that says that no that no new permanent immigrants from any country can be more than seven percent of the total in every year, and so that's why you see backlogs from India and China because they are a huge part of the of the uh, applications for um, employment-based green cards. By the way, green cards where they have proven that there's no immigrant available, no U.S. citizen available to do the to do the work. The U.S. government agreed has approved it and agreed that there is no one 
avail no one else available to do the work, excuse me, no, no other citizen to do the work. And yet because of the 7% the limit, you still have to wait your turn at, uh, as you cycle through every year. But yes, we still have a, a quota system in a variety of different categories. Um, then the, uh, the next question is, um, my current H-1B is expiring on August 10th and my current company is not planning to apply for my extension. I need to know if I have to get the visa via a new employer, by what date we need to file it. Well, um, um, it, it, it depends a bit on your situation, but my general advice is that you should, um, you should uh, try and transfer, get your uh, H-1B transferred um, to another company right away. I mean, uh, I mean, technically you have until your, um, you know, August 9th, to, to get your transfer filed, but that is cutting it very close. I wouldn't take that risk. Um, and then is the client letter mandatory for getting a visa extension? I mean, I get these questions a lot about the client letters. I don't know why people ask about the client letters. It is, it's a, you know, it's, it is an essential piece of evidence to every H-1B application. And um, um, at best you are risking you are, you're, you're cons at considerable risk of denial without a client letter. So you should be getting the client letter. If, you, if your client is not, if the client is not providing a letter, then in my experience, the situation is suspect. Um, do you know this, the, the next question, do you know the status of the recent bill about unused green card slots for foreign healthcare workers? Thank you. Um, I mean, it's in Congress and, you know, I was a lawmaker for many years when Congress wants to do something, they can do it as soon as they want. So it's only being held up as long as there is a lack of, of interest in, in, helping, in helping this along. So um, um, uh, the more Congress people that support doing this, the faster it will get passed. Uh, there, there really is no bureauc there's no necessary bureaucratic reason why it shouldn't be passed. It's only because uh, it does not have enough support in Congress. Uh, next question is, are green cards moving in July and August? Um, it depends on the category. Um, there is some movement. Um, <clears throat> you know, there, uh, because, the, because new employment-based green cards were um, put on hold for a while, there are some categories that are moving forward that had previously been in a, in a backlog. The EB-1 category is one example. Uh, they, the EB-1 category is really not supposed to have a backlog at all, but because of the country quotas, um, even the EB-1 category was seeing a backlog to like, you know, even a couple years. And so those have actually been moving a little faster because um, because um, a lot of those EB1s don't, I mean, those people are in country for the most part and uh, they're, you know, they're not subject to the prohibition. Um, so there is some movement, but um, I haven't looked at the, the, the bulletin recently. Um, if there's a particular question on looking on the, the latest visa bulletin and movement, then um, let me know, but you can always look to see if there's yourself to see if there's any movement. Um, yeah, on the, uh, the there's another question. Um, in, in case the visa is not submitted, considering the COVID situation, to when can I stay in the U.S.? You do have a, there is the 60 day grace period, um, but that is uh, I tell people about the 60 day grace period that it, that it is not um, it is not a law. It's only a discretionary consideration of whether you over, overstayed um, your visa when you apply for the next time. So, um, you know, if it's, you know, I, I tell people don't play the, the, the grace period game, don't game it in any way and try, don't, try, don't rely on it um, in any way. Just hurry up and, 
and get your visa transferred. And, and um, if it's just impossible, if, there are no, if you're not able to get another H-1B um, transfer, and you know, the, I never thought that I would be saying this anytime soon, but that is possible. There just are, are fewer and fewer jobs. Um, but I guess with the, the new H-1B suspension, maybe there's more opportunity for transfers. Um, and just try your hardest. And if you can't, um, consider going back to, to student status. Uh, you're, you're in August 10th. So um, I would, um, I would um, seriously lay out a plan for changing your status to student um, before expiration. Um, and that's before August 10th, too. That's before August 10th. Um, that's the questions I see for the moment. Um, what um, do the panelists or the, the moderators have any other questions? Are they getting any questions from other sources or um, how are we doing for time? I think we are doing good and uh, thanks for answering all the questions. Um, so let's wait for a few more questions uh, showing up on the chat room. And Ravi, uh, meanwhile- Ravi, Ravi, what are you hearing from the community? So um, I have one question regarding the, you know, immigration statuses. One of the participant asked, uh, you know, my visa is expiring on August 10th. I'm filing it right now. So we have been hearing communities and people are talking to, most of the people are talking about, you know, immigration offices are closed. But even if I send my papers, you know, in a month advance or two months in advance, if I don't get any response, is that a valid still to stay here in this country or do I need to leave the country after August 10th? if I don't hear any response from immigration? Good question. In general, you, have, uh, you, you are allowed to stay while you're a change of status is being considered, but you must submit that change of status prior to the expiration of your current status. You can only change from one status to another if it's from one valid status to another. So the 60 day grace period is only for H1B transfer to another H1B. Um, it does not apply to, uh, you don't have a 60 day grace period to change to a, an F1, for example. So um, that's why I said, um, um, if, um, you know, if the, the search for another um, H1 is not going very well right now. I know that it takes patience to find a job, but if it's not going well right now, then I would, um, I would uh, make a, a serious consideration to changing to, to an F1. And, that, and that's a pure F1. I'm not talking about uh, day one CPT, because I think you're gonna have a hard time finding a, a job on day one CPT as well, unless you, unless you have one, unless you have one. But um, the way things are going now, um, you may just want to go ahead and just you know, take advantage of this time to switch to another um, a master's program, MBA, in, um, in something that, that would, will uh, broaden your horizons or, um, you know, or further your education. Okay. Um, I got uh, one more question on the phone. Uh, what are the suggestions and guidance that you can give for uh, F1 students? You know, uh, sure. Uh, does it is it any more specific about what kind of guidance? No, just they are asking suggestions and guidance in regarding the visa. Yeah. Um, first of all, um, be in close touch with your DSO. Um, and it is absolutely essential that you be in close touch with your DSO. You know, now I, I have encountered situations where the DSO hasn't been entirely competent, but, but for these big universities, um, you know, the DSOs are on top of things um, and um, they're dedicated to, to the issues. Uh, make sure you keep in touch with them. Don't make any decisions on your immigration without checking with the DSO. Um, 
Second line of defense would be an immigration attorney, but really your DSO is, your DSO has access to your SEVIS record. Um, they can tell you where your situation is at in specific. Um, don't talk to an immigration lawyer about general immigration law and then, um, and then do your own analysis comparison to your personal situation. Well then, oh, well, if that's the rule, well then I must do this. That's not how it works. It's, it's uh, very situation specific. By God, please don't make life decisions from information you see online, on online discussion forums. Please, for God's sake, don't do that. Um, you, it, it never ceases to amaze me how many people who have spent their entire life working to get to the United States and make the decisions that guide the entire future of their time in the US on complete strangers on the internet. I don't understand that. I mean, think of the, particularly the typical IT worker who you're, you're looking at um, a, a lifetime earning potential of, of really several million dollars, uh, several million dollars. Um, why would you risk all of that on something that you're just trying to get for free. It, it makes no sense. Um, so check with your DSO. Yes, an immigration lawyer, but your DSO knows your situation more because they have your service record. They can, they know their own university's programs. Don't do, don't do things on the cheap. Please, please, please don't do things on the cheap. It's absolutely not worth it. Um, and that goes for the students who are looking to get an easy day one CPT university. I, I think um, certainly we know the situations where these fake universities have been set up with ICE and they promise these online classes um, and, <clears throat> and, uh, and cheap, and cheap uh, tuition and referral fees. And uh, just please, for God's sake, stay, stay away from those. Like, there are some people I just simply cannot convince uh, because there's some people who like to live, live on the edge. That is, is, there's just an addiction to the risk. But most people are smart. Um, you've worked too much. Don't risk your potential um, of, of, of the amount of money you're going to earn by making s some silly mistake over saving a few dollars on coursework. Um, that those are my, that's my advice to students. Um, students uh, also should not be going into business. Um, I just don't have the time. I, uh, I, I, uh, I, I have lengthy conversations with at least one student per quarter on why that's not good. Um, don't go into business, don't earn money. Don't earn money unless you're authorized with an EAD to do it in your field. That's another example. Um, there are some people who are getting into rental property. Um, you are playing with fire. And, and do, <laughs> go ahead and debate me all you want. You are playing with fire by going into business as an international student. And why you would risk, risk um, everything you have to look forward to in America by getting a few dollars is, um, I don't understand that. Find another way. It's better to go into debt than to violate your status. Um, and uh, so that's what I have. That's the advice I have for, for, for foreign students. Um, and um, uh, so there was another question. Does an H-1B expire as soon as you lose your job? The answer is yes. Well, you're, you're, the H-1B visa does not expire, but you are technically out of status once you lose your job because the one of the one of the requirements of your, your H-1B status is that you maintain the employment for which you were approved. So if you, if you are fired or you quit, you're laid off, you are out of status. Now, remember, I said earlier that there is a technical, technically a 30 day, a 60 day grace period, recognizing that sometimes this, this does happen. People, um, you know, people have lives, they've established lives here um, just because you're fired, maybe you're fired for a, a bad reason. Things can change on a dime. Your whole life shouldn't have to turn upside down. So there is this 60 day grace period to be able to transfer to another job with your H-1B visa. 
Um, so I guess the question I should say, does your H-1B expire? No, it doesn't expire, but you are out of status and you need to quickly get to another um, H-1B um, petitioning employer um, before that 60, day, 60 days run out, runs out. Um, there's a couple other questions. Do you help with filing EB-1 uh, visas for physicians or anyone else you recommend? Um, yes, um, I can. I uh, just want to make sure you know that uh, an, an EB-1 visa for a physician is probably uh, not going to work uh, because um, uh, physicians don't commonly fall under the um, uh, outstanding or extraordinary individual or the outstanding professor category. Um, certainly they, they are outstanding individuals. Should they be in such a category? Absolutely. Um, but they generally don't fall under the EB1 category. Um, they, uh, they generally go, um, they, but if there is someone, you know, if there's an established doctor with a, with, who has a current uh, H1B visa, um, their, their green card is not in process. Um, they think they have, uh, they think they have a shot at an EB1 in the EB1 category. Definitely give me a call. Uh, we would sit, we would sit down and have a consultation and, and go through that. Um, question is, can you please share some knowledge on the EB5 category, like where people can invest and get eligible for a green card? Um, that's, that's a big topic. Um, I'm not going to share information about that tonight. Um, if someone thinks that they have a fair amount of money to invest in the U.S., they might be eligible for the EB-5 category green card. Give me a call. We'll sit down and do a consultation and see if you fit in that. Otherwise, just Google it. I mean, there's, there's plenty of, plenty of information, basic information out there. Um, but if you do think that you, you know, after doing some reading, you think you do have what it takes, give me a call. We can do a consultation. Most people after hearing some of the details do not, but um, I'm happy to talk to anyone. I don't want to shoot down anyone's dreams or intentions. Um, do you help filing H-1B extensions or you could please suggest anyone who can help me with filing the H-1B extension? Um, certainly I can. Um, I wanna, uh, I'm glad the, the question was worded this way. Um, if you are the H-1B holder, you do not file an extension. Your employer files the extension for you. You do not have the option of filing the extension for yourself. The employer must do it. So if they are not doing it, and you seem to indicate earlier that they were um, on the, at least on the fence about, about it, um, then you're going to be out of luck. And that's, there's, there's no one who can do that extension. If, you know, if, uh, someone who has an H-1B generally has already has had a, an an attorney working with the company. Um, generally, that attorney will continue to do those things. So uh, definitely check with the company if, and if they're going to do that. Um, I think if, um, if, the, if a company is holding you off until the last minute as to whether they're going to file an extension for you, I would start looking for a different company now. Um, they do not have your interests in mind. Uh, let's see. There's one question in the uh, chat box. Ah, we'll take a look. Uh, yes, another question. How, do, how does this ban work uh, for F1 students practical training? Um, and I'm going to assume that this is referring to people on the optional practical training, the OPT student, F1 students. Um, and um, the, uh, the answer is this would not affect them um, because the, the, um, the prohibition or the, what the, the announcement that ICE made was that, um, was that uh, this F1 students who were required to take in-classroom coursework um, would not be allowed to take online classwork. If you're on OPT and you're working um, you're not, if you, and you don't have to be in the, in a classroom anyway, then this would not affect you. If you have further questions about that, you can always give me a call. Um, another question, my husband's lawyer was not a competent person, screwed up the paperwork. 
We were forced to buy a book on U.S. immigration and go through most of the process by ourselves. Not an easy process, but it can be done. Um, uh, yes, I mean the you know the the process the the system is not is not designed or, or does not require anyone to have a lawyer. Um, these days, I don't know why you would do it without one. I mean, I just you know if you're you know if people enjoy a challenge. Um, if they um, if they just if they truly um, don't have the money, I guess. Uh, but um, you know, we've, I tell people, you know, what is the goal? And if the goal is to play around with the bureaucracy and and kind of shake your fist at the red tape and say, look, I'm this this is I'm fighting the government. Well, okay, then do it yourself. But if the goal is is your spouse. Um, you, the goal, you know, you want to get on with your lives together. Do it right the first time. Um, yes, there are some times where um, uh, there are attorneys that are not competent. Um, just like in anywhere, look for another one. Um, uh, do we see any additional questions? Um. No, I, I think uh, that's the last one. Ravi, what are you hearing from you, the community in terms of their, their, their worry, um, their planning? Um, is, there, is there a common theme that you're hearing? A common theme, um, you know, most of the people that who are on H1 and F1 visas, they're always concerned with the uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And uh, every few weeks, um, there are some announcement from government, mm -hmm. you know, sending people back to India or other countries, wherever they came from. And then, you know, that kind of uncertainty is there. But based on this situation, would you see any major changes in immigration system, you know, after COVID situation or during this COVID situation? Well, yes, I mean, it is, it is a major, it is a major change in, in the middle of, in the middle of H1B season. And we have, we have um, about 80,000 new H1B visas that have, have been approved or will be approved soon that are supposed to come on October. Um, many of those people are here in the U.S. Many of them are not. And um, there is a, at least a huge chunk of that 80,000 that are not going to be able to come to the U.S. to do the job for which they were approved by a U.S. company. And I might also add that the, it's not just a job. It is a specific job that was listed in the application for which these uh, people are needed. So it's not simply we're here to work, you know, here's an open slot to come and replace an American worker anywhere possible. An H-1B visa requires the application to list specifically what they will be doing and for how long. We had an earlier question about the client letter. Um, that's part of the proof to show that in a, in a subcontracting situation, the client is confirming that this job is, is needed and what they will be doing and the hours that they'll be working and who's going to supervise and um, how much they're going to be paid. Um, all, the, all of these hoops have been jumped through. And the employer, the American employer has foot the bill. You're, the the foreign national is not allowed to pay the bill for these applications. So um, you have all of this all of this effort, and these people who have been approved are not going to be allowed back in on October first. And I say allowed back in because uh, uh, I would say a large you know, by and large these people have. Um, worked under, worked for them under OPT or uh, some other way, or, um, or maybe there's a transfer. Um, but, um, you know, what, what are, what are, what's going to happen to the economy when 
these projects are not going to be able to be delivered. Mm -hmm. um, there, before the before this recession, I mean, there was maybe you can agree with me. I mean, there was less than two percent unemployment in IT. It was probably it was less. I mean, perhaps there was a negative unemployment. You couldn't find people. Uh, mm -hmm. my, my applications, the prevailing wage has been skyrocketing for the last five years. It's been, you know, every year there is a huge jump in the prevailing wage. And that's a, you know, that's a grumbling from employers, but they didn't have a choice. There's no one else to do it. Um, that's the, that's the, that's the bare minimum that needs to be approved, that needs to be paid. And still they're willing to go forward with it. Why? Because these projects are necessary. Okay, so are these projects going to no longer be necessary? Okay, well, maybe, but um, I haven't yet seen any, uh, any real evidence of cancellation of projects. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe there will be, maybe there won't, but um, the ability for a company to continue to deliver, for, to deliver its product to deliver its services depends on IT. Um, and to a large extent, that's not going to happen because of the mm -hmm. suspension. So that's a large, that's a huge, it's a huge impact. Yeah. Yeah, it relates to that one. Uh, you know, one of the person yesterday I was talking to, he came to me and he said, yeah, currently I'm working, my job is still there, but I'm on H1 but I'm getting the, another good opportunity in another company. Can I move on, you know, on H-1B visa? So what is your suggestion? Stay with the same company or is it better to move on? Is there any problems after moving in, you know, filing extension or transferring the H-1? I, I think you have to look at your, the individual situation. Um, you know, that really needs to, uh, that needs to be analyzed. But, but look here, here's, here's the way Here's the way this could be shooting ourselves in the foot as a country. Um, in the early 2000s, the late 90s, early 2000s, we had the big problem. You know, the America had the big problem with its jobs being outsourced. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them were outsourced, but then there was a reversal of the jobs being insourced because people, you know, the companies realized that there were problems with, you know, it wasn't easy to simply outsource a role. Well, if it's one thing that the quarantine has shown, it is easier and easier, it is easier than ever to outsource one's role, at least remotely. I mean, look how, look at how smoothly this, this presentation came off. There are collaborations going on on Zoom or whatever platform better than ever. And some, some places may never even go back. So the people who, are not no longer allowed to have their H-1B visa, do you really think someone else is going to be hired? Or is that same person in India or China simply going to continue the work that they were doing, except remotely from India or China? And for pennies, for pennies, of what they were being paid before. And those pennies are going to be now going to be spent in India or China and not going to be spent on, on um, Nissan Ultimas or uh, televisions or, um, or, or what have you in the United States. So, um, you know, I just, uh, there is the, the country our country is a function. The United States, um, the the success of the United States is a direct function of its of its immigrant class because the immigrant class are the hungry ones. They are the they are the not the sole innovators, but they are the ones driven driven the most. That is what has made us a country, the greatest. A country on uh, on Earth because of that productivity. We don't sit on our laurels. Um, if you track the success of the United States, you can you can directly you, that can be directly tracked with 
the influx of immigrants of that time. Um, there's just, you just can't ignore it. And so uh, when you remove the immigrant drive of the United States, you remove the drive of the United States um, in general. Um, so, um, so that's the, that's the biggest change, Ravi, is the, is the thought that we, that the country can do without non-citizens. Okay. It cannot, it is our fabric. We got uh, two more questions. Uh, if we have an, a GC approved 140 from New Jersey state, and then if we move to another state, do we need to restart the paperwork or file a new I-140 again? This is with no change in employer, but only location change. Kindly provide your inputs. Uh, there may need to be some sort of amendment in the, uh, you probably, probably not. You probably will need to provide evidence of the, um, the approximation of the role once your, once your adjustment of status comes about. But um, the, um, but I think what it will, what it is important, what the important impact of the change of state will be on, I assume, the uh, the H-1B visa that the, the individual is on. Um, that is very important. You have to be very mindful of that. And you have to be mindful that your H-1B doesn't fall completely out of line with the I-140, even though they are technically not connected. What you're doing on your H-1B is an indication of what your I-140 your job will eventually be, and it cannot go. It cannot go. Uh, you know, cannot go out of whack from one another. And you really should. You really need to have an attorney look at look closely at your entire situation to fully answer your question. Uh, Dilip from Kolkata. Yeah, <laughs> he's from India, right? No, he's in India. Yeah, well, it must be about nine thirty p.m. there. Um, residential question, left Minnesota buying one way air ticket to India, now would like to go back to Minnesota. I'm a US citizen, question is, how long will it take to get my residence status in Minnesota? Um, it's a 7 a.m. in India. 20 days, uh, to, but um, I mean, your residence status for what purpose, voting? Um, I think it's 20 days or 30 days. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure what difference it makes. Well, I think we're past the um, eight o'clock time if there are no other burning questions that people can, um, uh, maybe somewhere we can um, put my contact information. Why don't I go ahead and type in my contact information I guess I should have put it right in the PowerPoint itself. But uh, let me put my email address in the, in the uh, chat. Sure. You can email me. Okay. Thank you very much, Satvir. And uh, it's a great, uh, you know, session. And I'm sure a lot of uh, questions got answered. Um, you know, Thanks for sharing your email as well to the community for asking the questions and, and also especially your time, your busy schedule and time. Thanks for the opportunity as well. Thank you for moderating this well and thank you again to Seva for organizing this uh, essential talk. Thank you all. Thank you.